Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men. To be or to become chosen is not an exclusive status conferred upon us. Rather, you and I ultimately can choose to be chosen through the righteous exercise of our moral agency. God does not have a list of favorites to which we must hope our names will someday be added. He does not limit the chosen to a restricted few. Instead, our hearts, our desires, our honoring of sacred gospel covenants and ordinances, our obedience to the commandments, and most importantly, the Savior's redeeming grace and mercy determine whether we are counted as one of God's chosen. In the busyness of our daily lives and in the commotion of the contemporary world in which we live, we may be distracted from the eternal things that matter the most by making pleasure, prosperity, popularity, and prominence our primary priorities. Our short-term preoccupation with the things of the world and the honors of men may lead us to forfeit our spiritual birthright for far less than a mess of pottage. I repeat the admonition of the Lord to His people delivered through the Old Testament prophet Haggai. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Each of us should evaluate our temporal and spiritual priorities sincerely and prayerfully to identify the things in our lives that may impede the bounteous blessings that Heavenly Father and the Savior are willing to bestow upon us. And surely the Holy Ghost will help us to see ourselves as we really are. Being aware of all that is necessary for us in this life, the Savior invites us to seek Him in every thought and follow Him with all our heart. This gives us the promise that we can walk in His light and that His guidance prevents the influence of darkness in our life. Seeking Christ in every thought and following Him with all our heart requires that we align our mind and desires with His. The scriptures refer to this alignment as standing fast in the Lord. This course of action implies that we continually conduct our lives in harmony with the gospel of Christ and focus daily on everything that is good. Only then we may achieve the peace of God which passeth all understanding and which will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Savior Himself instructed the elders of the Church in February 1831, Treasure these things up in our hearts, in your hearts, and let the solemnities of eternity rest upon your minds. Despite our continuous efforts to seek out the Lord, inappropriate thoughts may penetrate our mind. When such thoughts are permitted and even invited to stay, they can shape the desires of our heart and lead us to what we will become in this life and eventually to what we'll, we will inherit for eternity. Elder Neil A. Maxwell once emphasized this principle by saying, Desires determine the degradations in outcomes, including why many are called but few are chosen. The Lord said, for many are called, but few are chosen. We are called when hands are laid upon our heads and we are given the priesthood. But we are not chosen until we have demonstrated to God our righteousness, our faithfulness, and our commitment. To stay on the right track, we must honor and sustain those who hold the presiding priesthood keys. We are reminded that many are called, but few are chosen. When are we chosen? We are chosen by the Lord only when we have done our best to move this holy work forward through our consecrated efforts and talents. Our efforts must always be guided by righteous principles, 
set forth by the Lord in the 121st section of the Doctrine and Covenants. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile. Whether in their conception or expression, our desires profoundly affect the use of our moral agencies. Desires thus become real determinants, even when with pitiful naivete we do not really want the consequences of our desires. Desire denotes a real longing or craving. Hence, righteous desires are much more than passive preferences or fleeting feelings. Of course, our genes and circumstances and environments matter very much, and they shape us significantly. Yet there remains an inner zone in which we are sovereign unless we abdicate. In this zone lies the essence of our individuality and our personal accountability. Therefore, what we insistently desire over time is what we will eventually become and what we will receive in eternity. Like it or not, therefore, reality requires that we acknowledge our responsibility for our desires. Brothers and sisters, which do we really desire? God's plans for us or Satan's? Whenever spiritually significant things are underway, righteous desires are present. Meek desire characterize those awaiting baptism at the waters of Mormon. With their baptismal commitments spelled out specifically, they exclaimed, this is the desire of our hearts. The Nephite multitude, enraptured by the presence of the resurrected Jesus, knelt in humble and intensive prayer. Yet they did not multiply many words, for it was given unto them what they should pray, and they were filled with desire. No wonder desires also determine the gradations in outcomes, including why many are called, but few are chosen. It is up to us. God will facilitate, but he will not force. Righteous desires need to be relentless, therefore, because, said President Brigham Young, quote, the men and women who desire to obtain seats in the celestial kingdom will find that they must battle every day, end quote. Therefore, true Christian soldiers are more than weekend warriors. Remember, brothers and sisters, it is our own desires which determine the sizing and the attractiveness of various temptations. We set our own thermostats as to temptations. Thus, educating and training our desires clearly requires understanding the truths of the gospel. Yet even more is involved. President Brigham Young confirmed, saying, It is evident that many who understand the truth do not govern themselves by it. Consequently, no matter how true and beautiful truth is, you have to take the passions of the people and mold them to the laws of God. Do you, President Young asked, think that people will obey the truth because it is true unless they love it? No, they will not." End quote. Thus, knowing gospel truths and doctrines is profoundly important, but we must also come to love them. When we love them, they will move us and help our desires and outward works to become more holy. One message missed by so many in our time is the word of the Lord commanding us to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. We are told that many are called, but few are chosen. And the reason is that their hearts are so set upon the things of this world. The Savior's transcendent message in the Sermon on the Mount is of burning bush importance to all of us. But seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness. 
This message needs to penetrate into our hearts and souls. As we accept this message, we are taking our personal stand in this life. Regular temple attendance will help us constantly seek to build up the kingdom of God. Elder Marion G. Romney said, The fruits of the gospel, assurance that we shall obtain eternal life, peace in this world sustained by such an assurance, and finally eternal life in the world to come, are within the reach of us all. Sometimes, however, because of our lack of understanding and appreciation of them, I am persuaded that we take too much for granted. We assume that because we are members of the Church, we shall receive as a matter of course all the blessings of the Gospel. I have heard people contend that they have a claim upon them because they have been through the Temple, even though they are not careful to keep the covenants they there made. I do not think this will be the case. We might take a lesson from an account given by the Prophet Joseph Smith of a vision of the Resurrection, in which he records that one of the saddest things he had ever witnessed was the sorrow of members of the church who came forth to a resurrection below that which they had taken for granted they would receive. I conceive the blessings of the gospel to be of such inestimable worth that the price for them must be very exacting, and if I correctly understand what the Lord has said on the subject, it is. The price, however, is within the reach of us all, because it is not to be paid in money nor in any of this world's goods but in righteous living. What is required is wholehearted devotion to the gospel and unreserved allegiance to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speaking to this point, the prophet taught that those who keep the commandments of the Lord and walk in his statutes to the end, are the only individuals who shall receive the blessings.